He performs miracles and seeks no credit? Well, what does he look like? Is he a member of Sanhedrin? Would you at least know him if you saw him again? <laughs> I don't know why I am sharing this with you. I, I don't understand it myself. But here is what I can tell you. I was one way. And now I am completely different. And the thing that happened in between was him. Welcome to your online coffee break, where we discuss bite-sized topics that inspire, educate, and entertain. Here's your host, a software innovator, award-winning marketer, and astronomy and space buff, Chuck Fields. Hello, thanks for joining me today for your online coffee break. Today, it's my pleasure to introduce Dallas Jenkins. Dallas is the creator and director of The Chosen, the number one crowdfunded media project of all time, raising $10 million from 16,000 investors. This groundbreaking streaming TV series is about the life of Jesus and those that encountered him. It was created completely outside the Hollywood system to maintain content control. The decision to remain autonomous led their team to come up with a new and innovative ways for viewers to experience The Chosen, including the first ever worldwide launch of a streaming TV series via its own app. Two years ago, this began as a short film for Dallas's local church, shot entirely on his friend's farm in Illinois. So far, season one of The Chosen has been downloaded in 180 countries worldwide and viewed over 4.5 million times and being translated into 52 languages. Put that down for a catch. A little farther out. I don't have a quarrel with you, teacher. But we've been doing this all night. Nothing. All right. That's your word. Online Coffee Break. Dallas, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Oh, thanks for having me on. It's good to be here. Um, my pleasure. Now, my wife and I just finished all eight episodes of season one of The Chosen, and I have to say I am a huge fan. We both are. It is a brilliant series. Um, but other than just me explaining it, I was wondering if you could just give us in your own words just sort of the big picture about The Chosen for our viewers out there. Well, I'm glad to hear that you got through all eight episodes. That typically means you're you legitimately liked it. You're not Absolutely. just faking it because no, you, you can't you can't fake all eight. So I appreciate that. Sure. Yeah, it's been quite a ride. Um, you know, I think the thing that sets the chosen apart from other Jesus projects or other Bible projects, and I think it's what's causing people to respond like you the way that they are, is we are following. In fact, I'm wearing a, a T-shirt that says this. This is one of our, our T-shirts that says "Get Used to Different." I love that. Um, it's one of the shirts we're actually offering right now at our, our merch store, um, and that comes from a line from Episode Seven. Yes. When Simon Peter is questioning Jesus and he's wondering why Jesus is making a particular decision, and Jesus says, "Get used to different," and that's something that we've actually followed from the beginning. I think with this project. Um, the content itself is different. You know, it's yeah. the first ever multi-season show about the life of Christ. There's been movies, there's been miniseries, but there's never actually been a multi-season show right. that allows you to dig deeper into the characters, into the stories of the Gospels in a way that allows you to connect emotionally. And I've seen pretty much all the Jesus projects ever. I've been a believer as long as I can remember. Mm -hmm. And most of them are, are enjoyable to watch because I'm I'm watching something that I recognize. Right. I, I've re read the stories, but I can't say that I've ever, other than perhaps the Passion of the Christ and maybe a few other moments, that I've actually had an emotional connection. Uh, it's typically an intellectual one or a spiritual appreciation of what I'm watching. But the reason that I, and I think many others, binge watch shows all the time uh, is because when you go from season to season, you really connect. 
Right. And when, when one of the main characters has something significant happen, you feel it and you live life kind of through their eyes. And we believe that if you can see Jesus through the eyes of those who actually met him, you can be impacted in the same way they were. And the best way for that to happen is in a multi-season show like this where we take our time. So you said you watched all eight episodes. Well, that covers pretty much just a few weeks of the story. Uh, we're yes. hoping to do eight seasons of this show. I cannot wait. And we're going to cover, you know, all, all the all the greatest hits. But I think it's those moments in between the greatest hits, uh, the moments in between some of these stories that allow us to really connect and make those gospel moments that much more impactful. Well, it was definitely impactful for me. But what really amazed me, too, is just the beginnings of, of this. I understand it started about two years ago uh, as a short film for your local church. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, uh, yeah this comes from very humble beginnings. Uh, which I think is parallel to the story of Christ in many ways. Yes. Um, and the I was coming off of a career failure. Uh, my last feature film called The Resurrection of Gavin Stone. Mm -hmm. um, if you haven't heard of it, that's probably because uh, you're like many others. who it, uh, The movie didn't do very well at the box office. Uh. Those who saw it really liked it. I'm still proud of the film. But um, it bombed at the box office. And I went from a director with a very bright future because I had done that movie with some pretty significant Hollywood producers who wanted to do multiple films with me. Yeah to a director with very little future. And very long story short, um, God pressed it very powerfully and clearly on my heart through my wife and through a, a friend of mine that it's not my job to feed the 5,000. It's only to provide the loaves and fish. Hmm. And that is a life truth that I think I probably could have known if you asked me, but I, I certainly didn't live that way. And I think a lot of us don't live that way. Right. Um, and so I, I realized my job is just to make sure that whatever loaves and fish I provide are as um, healthy and good as they can be. And so that if God chooses to multiply them, that it's actually a good thing. Mm -hmm. And so I poured myself into a short film for my church's Christmas Eve service, which was all it was intended to be. It was shot on my friend's farm in Illinois, and it was about the birth of Christ from the perspective of the shepherds. And while I was watching that, and also doing my usual binge watching with my wife, we watch a lot of shows on Netflix and um, yeah, you know, other, other, other services. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, you know what? There's never actually been a multi-season show about Christ. Mm -mm. And in the 20-minute short film that I'm doing about the birth of Christ, I'm seeing more in this story than in almost any time that I've ever heard this story before. Just by exploring the shepherds' lives from the beginning of the day to the end of the, of the night. Mm. And that gives me so much more. Like I, I, It was kind of a process of discovery for me. I was like, man, this is so interesting. And what their lives may have been like that afternoon leading up until the moment when they met the, the Christ child, right. this is so fascinating. Yeah, And it turns out the people who watched it felt the same way, that it was very fascinating. Again, very long story short, that short film for my church ended up getting in the hands of a streaming service. They heard my idea. They loved it. They decided they wanted to do it as a show like I did. Mm -hmm. And they decided to raise the money through crowdfunding, which I thought was a ludicrous idea. Um, I thought there was no way it would work because crowdfunding rarely works. And it's usually for really small projects. And the uh, all-time crowdfunding record was $5.7 million for projects that already had big fan bases and, and uh, big audiences. And we were starting from scratch, and I was coming off of a failure in my career. And so but I said, you know what? Loaves and fishes. It's not my job to worry about feeding the 5,000. So right, exactly. We launched that short film, that little loaf and fish that I had put together for my church. And it went viral, and that ended up raising over $10 million from over 19,000 people around the world. <sighs> for season one of The Chosen. And so you, the, what you were able to watch was because of uh, the other loaves and fish from people all over the world. And uh, now the rest is history. And so the response has been pretty overwhelming. But the story of how it came has been kind of a bizarre ride. Oh, yeah, it is. And Dallas, I understand you were, you were just happy if you got $800 for the crowdfunding. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like that's, said... become, yeah. <laughs> that's become a bit of a famous story because I was like, guys, if we raise $800, I'll be impressed. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we seem to we seem to pass that pretty quickly. And now it's the number one crowdfunded media project of all time. I mean, that's just incredible yeah. on that. So obviously the response has been wonderful. And I guess, you know, you said there are several factors that set the chosen apart from other contemporary series. Um, I know for me, you know, I've seen the passion and, and love that, of course. But I guess what really stood out is sort of the, the backstories. And I'm going to do a little bit of spoilers, but not quite. But even the way that Jesus was introduced sort of at the end of the first episode, uh, again, that's played by Jonathan Rumi, does a fantastic job. I love the backstory of Simon Peter. I love how Nicodemus is is portrayed. What? How did you decide to sort of, I guess it's just awesome character development? Because we very seldom, you know, 
dive into, I guess, the stories of the disciples, the story of the religious leaders, but you did in such a human way. What made you decide to do that? Yeah, a friend of mine said that a lot of times in Jesus projects, there's three disciples. There's Simon, because he's the most famous one. Mm-hmm. There's Judas, because he's the bad guy. Right. And then there's the other 10. Yes. And they all they all <laughs> look and sound the same. Uh, and you don't really get to dive into their uh, to who they are and who they were before exactly. they met Christ. And that to us, um, we just found to be an area that has been previously unexplored. Mm-hmm. And I think that because I love some of the same shows that most people love, uh, the thing that set those shows apart is you really get to dive into these people. And ultimately, audiences watch people. That's why they tune into a to a show. Mm-hmm. Even a show like Stranger Things or Game of Thrones, some of these really famous shows or Walking Dead, um, they have these big arcs and, and, and mythologies and storylines that people are interested to see what happens next. Yeah. But the reason that these shows are successful is because you tune in because you want to see who those people are mm-hmm. and how they are reacting to the events around them. And when we dig into the Gospels and thought, think, all right, who do we want to portray that we find would make for a good character in a TV show? Now, that sounds like a crass way to put it, because you don't like to necessarily look at these gospel stories as uh, as ripe for television. Right. But we're trying to make a great TV show that people will watch, mm-hmm. pure and simple. And when you do that, you find that there's so much rich stuff in the Gospels, and there's so many interesting things to explore. So you yes. brought up Simon Peter, you brought up Nicodemus. We chose those people specifically because of their character arcs. And if you see in the Gospels, um, you can find a really great story like John chapter 3, where Nicodemus meets Jesus on the roof. I'm just going to use this as an example. Yeah. So we go, well, that's the most famous story in the Bible. It's pretty straightforward. Nicodemus is on the roof meeting with Jesus. And he believes that Jesus is the Messiah and Jesus is trying to explain it to him. When you think about what may have gotten Nicodemus to that place when he was a member of a religious leadership that didn't believe Jesus was the Messiah, to the extent that Nicodemus actually met Jesus at night undercover, we know that when we see Nicodemus again later in the Gospels, he's still kind of playing both sides. He's, he shows up at the trial of Jesus and defends Jesus, but in kind of a general way, like, hey, maybe we should let him speak for himself. You know, let's be, let's be fair to him. He's right. clearly not out of the closet, as it were, as a believer of Jesus. But then at the end of the Gospels, we see him show up at the death and burial and to where he's providing tens of thousands of dollars of, of um, perfumes and spices for the burial. Mm-hmm. And when you go, huh, Think about that. Think about the the almost the double agent nature of Nicodemus and what it must have been like for him to uh, to question whether or not he should give up all that he's had for for this Messiah. Um, and he didn't ultimately do it until the end. So there's tons of material to play with. There. Dallas, I just want to tell you on 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 that one. Oh my gosh, when Jesus is with Nicodemus um, and they're they're sitting and like I said, they arranged the meeting at night. I did not come to deliver the people from Rome. And from what? From sin. From spiritual death. God loves the world in this way. That he gave his only son. That whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So this has nothing to do with Rome. It's all about Sin. God did not send his son into the world to condemn it, Nicodemus. He sent him to save it through him. It's as simple as Moses' serpent on the pole. Whoever believes in him will not be condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already. Have you ever heard anything like this before? Again, reading it is one thing, but seeing the way you visualized it, I mean, it, it just tugged at my heart so strongly. That was a well, beautiful scene. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's one of our favorite scenes in the whole show. But I think undoubtedly one of the main reasons that that scene was so powerful for people is because of the time we took mm-hmm. to let you get to know Nicodemus and right. what his desires were, what his struggles were, um, how, what may have, you know, you start with you start with that story and then you work your way backwards and you go, what was it about Nicodemus that may have led him to believe that Jesus was the Messiah? Mm-hmm. What could have happened in his life that would have opened him up to believing that this guy from Nazareth could have been the son of God. Right. And we explore that. And we take the time over the course of several episodes to show you his life and his marriage yes. and 
same thing with Simon Peter showing Simon married at home because we knew he had a wife because we mm-hmm. knew he had a, mo- a mother-in-law. And so when you ex- take the time to explore those things and you do it in a plausible way that's well-researched through history and through the Bible right. um, and through the cultural context of the time, you can create a plausible scenario that doesn't contradict Scripture, but in fact enhances and supports your experience with Scripture so that the old show ultimately, as many people have told us, brings them back to Scripture right. and makes it even more alive. Then that's that's the uh, the triple threat that you you can't uh, you can't you can't get better than that, and that's what we're trying to do with the show. Oh, well, it's brilliant! And another thing that I'm I'm just really impressed about, and something I guess we both have in common is I understand you have a a daughter on the autism on autism spectrum, and I, have, yeah. I we have a son who's on the autism spectrum as well. So obviously, a little bit of spoiler: the character portrayal of Matthew just really really touched home. Uh, can you yeah. tell us a little bit more about the reason behind it? Cause I totally agree with you, but I, I love the reasoning you have about that. Yeah. So when we were looking for ways to make each of our uh, main characters vibrant and alive and interesting, uh, as opposed to some of the two dimensional ways that you sometimes see them in the, in the scripture, mm-hmm. it doesn't mean they're not interesting, but it's just, they're in two, di- they're, they're only on the page. You right. don't get to know a lot about them. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things that we noticed about Matthew was, okay, he's a numbers guy. Um, Because he's a tax collector and an an accountant. He's a facts guy. His opening chapter is just nothing but a genealogy. Exactly. And then he also chose a profession which made him a social outcast. Well, I have a lot of familiarity in the autism world. Uh, I have a lot of family members who are autistic, including my daughter. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm probably on the Asperger's spectrum myself. Um, I've done a lot of volunteer work in the uh, special needs community. So it just made a lot of sense to us that, huh, this, it could be plausible that Matthew was on the autism spectrum. And wouldn't that be such a fascinating way to kind of make a unique to just to build a unique character, but that's not in contradiction with scripture because it did seem to fit within some of his personality traits. Mm -hmm. So uh, because I'm so familiar with it, we were able to do it plausibly. We've been, uh, we've heard from many parents, including like you're saying just now, uh, we've heard from many parents and including um, we heard from a 16 year old girl who is on, who is autistic, Mm -hmm. who wrote us a handwritten letter that was just beautiful. We're actually doing a video about her uh, soon that that will be really cool, oh, um, who was truly impacted because I think for people to be able to see a Bible character portrayed that they can relate to, which is ultimately our goal with the show. We exactly. want you to be able to relate to somebody, mm-hmm. whether you're a parent or a, or, a, or someone who struggles with autism. Um, even, the use, even the use of the word struggle is probably um, a misnomer because some people look at it like a struggle, but in other ways, like with Matthew, you can see it as both a strength and a weakness, it can be a strength because it can make you good at your job and make exactly. you good at certain things. So we mm-hmm. really wanted to explore all that. And so the show explores not only racial and spiritual and intellectual diversity, but neurological diversity. <laughs> and uh, we think that makes for a really interesting, as you get into future seasons, uh, recognizing how frustrated Simon might be with Matthew, not only for the fact that he's a tax collector, but because as Simon says in episode four, you're a little off, aren't you? And <laughs> We just thought that would be a really thing, interesting thing to explore. It was wonderful. And speaking of additional seasons, and you're right, I did binge watch this. Once I uh, saw episode one, I was like, oh, I got to keep going. And then a ah, couple days later, I'm done with all eight episodes. Um, but when's season two? How's that? Uh, I, know, I know we're progressing toward that. Uh, what's yeah. the status on that? So we don't have a big TV uh, network or studio financing, writing big check for the show. We're right. doing this all grassroots. We're doing this all. Uh, you know, as you know, we raised the money for season one through crowdfunding. Mm -hmm. So season two is going to be the same thing, but we're hoping that over time income is enough income is generated for the show, whether it's through DVD sales or merchandise sales, like my t-shirt or through what we call pay it forward, which is the primary engine that's going to over the life of the show finance this series, which is that we're giving the series away. I mean, this series is available for free, uh, all eight episodes free in the United States, Mm -hmm. several episodes for free, around the world and if people around the world who can't afford to keep watching well the way to do that for them to keep watching is for people like you and me to pay it forward after we're done watching it so there's an option on the app the chosen is free on the app you just go to the app store or google play Dallas, I want to talk to you about that because again the pay it forward feature i love that um in addition of course we, i bought season one and one of the neat things is is by purchasing season one or whatever you are allowing other um, right. users out there to watch the app. And it's kind of neat. It even says, it says uh, X number of people have, and it says their name and what city they're from, have watched an episode courtesy of you. And I, I just think it's neat because it, it's like, 
a great way to, to give back to, to a wonderful, wonderful cause and, and for the future, for the future seasons. Um, and I have to say, we were very impressed with the app itself and just the technology. And as yeah. you're going, can you tell us a little bit more about the app and, and how people can yeah. consume the episodes? Yeah, and that's that's in line with your question about season two, which is why I brought it up that way. So when I was saying earlier, get used to different is one of our themes. There's also the Bible verse, Isaiah 43, 19, which says, behold, I am doing a new thing. Yes. Um, and that's also, again, aligned with get used to different. But the, um, you know, the way it was financed is a new thing. The number one highest crowdfunded media project of all time. The right. content itself, the first ever multi-season show about the life of Christ. Mm -hmm. The app itself, the way you watch it is a new thing. So often we Christians, especially in media, are following behind the trends of the world. Well, this app is literally new technology that hasn't been used before where you can download the app to your phone. And some may say, well, I don't want to watch the show on my phone. Well, this app technology allows you to connect directly to your streaming devices, Roku, Apple TV, Fire Stick, Chromecast, without needing a subscription. And again, it's free. And you can connect it directly to your devices through your app. And like we said, you can watch all eight episodes for free. Now, that's where the, the, the means to get it to the world is also a new thing, which is this pay it forward option. Right. So if you love the show, we say, look, we're not requiring you to pay for it. But if you have the means... Just know that when you do that, when you pay it forward, it allows people around the world to watch it for free. And so there's, you know, some countries, I mean, we're now in over 180 countries. Um, we're being currently translated into about 70 languages. And it's allowing people, because of people like yourself who paid it forward, it allows you to uh, allow them to see it for free. And then they can pay it forward if they so choose. And that is not only letting them see it, but it's how we finance future episodes and seasons. So when you buy a T-shirt or, you know, at a merch store, or when you're getting the DVDs or when you're paying it forward, it's accomplishing multiple things. But primarily, it's also accomplishing our ability to do future seasons and episodes. So when does season two come? Um, well, we're writing it now. We, are, we would love, our goal is to get it, uh, at least the first four episodes out by Thanksgiving of 2020. But in order to do that, we need lots of people to pay it forward. Lots of people to buy DVDs. And then eventually, probably in the next couple of months, we may open it up for investment again, like we did for season one. But long term, eventually it's going to have to start paying for itself through the Pay It Forward program. That's wonderful. Dallas, again, I want to congratulate you and your team for this fantastic work. The Chosen is fantastic. Highly encourage all our viewers and listeners out there to go download the app, start watching today, and help spread the word. Dallas, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Really appreciate thanks, it. Thanks so much for having me on and for enjoying the show. It means a lot. Online Coffee Break. Wow, I really enjoyed my conversation with Dallas today, and I'm loving The Chosen Season 1. Cannot wait till Season 2 comes out. Please check out Season 1. Again, you can just go to your app store for your phone and download The Chosen app. Or if you'd like to learn more, just go to their website at thechosen.tv. I want to thank Dallas for joining me today. I want to thank you for joining us as well. Uh, if you'd like to share this episode with a friend, we'd certainly appreciate it. We also love it if you give us a thumbs up if you're watching on YouTube or a five-star rating on your favorite podcast application. Thanks again for joining us today. We'll see you next time. God bless.